In this video, I'm going to improve on the pulse dupe cooler from my last video and build a device that can cool down to minus 75C, which is almost cold enough to freeze carbon dioxide. Of course, this is still a long way from my goal of creating liquid nitrogen, which condenses at minus 196C, but still a big leap forward from my first attempt, which only managed to drop the temperature by a few degrees. For starters, I'm going to need to ditch the linear motor, at least for now, because it doesn't provide the power I need to get good compression. Designing and optimizing a linear motor is a whole separate project of its own, and even with an optimized motor, it really only works best at one specific frequency. With a conventional rotary motor, I have thousands of cheap options, the ability to pick whatever gear reduction ratio I want, and the luxury of using a flywheel, which is a crucial element in handling the large compression forces since adiabatic compression causes a sharp exponential rise in pressure relative to the piston stroke. Speaking of flywheels, I haven't played with my giant gyroscope toy lately. I built it a few months ago for a video, but it's just been collecting dust ever since. The flywheel on that thing is perfect for this project, and it's even made for an 8mm shaft, which I want to use, so this is a no-brainer. Time to do a little recycling. Next I got this brushless motor. This is 1100 kV and I'll be running at 12 volts, so it should spin at about 1300 RPM full throttle without a load. It'll bolt onto this 3D printed bracket. Here's the inertance tube. It's 2 meters of 2 millimeter diameter copper tube wound into a coil, which looks suspiciously like an inductor in an electrical circuit. It'll connect to this 2 liter tank, and together they'll provide the phase shift for the pneumatic circuit. The end fittings are just 1 8 MPT caps, which I drilled out until the tubing fits snugly inside them, then I heated the fitting with a blowtorch and melted solder into the cap like it was a cup. This makes a very thick, reliable joint. To mount all the hardware, I've just got some scrap plywood and 2x4 cutoffs as spacers for the cylinder. Since it's just a prototype, I didn't really feel the need to make it look fancy. I'm going to be using a 25mm bore pneumatic cylinder with a 50mm stroke. The pneumatic cylinders have rubber lip seals, so they have a lot more friction than a typical piston with metal rings and oil lubricant, but they have the advantage that they're zero blow-by, so the piston will hold pressure. They're also not very expensive. I figured the excess friction was acceptable for running at lower frequencies, say below 15Hz or so. For the crankshaft, I use these blocks that'll attach to 8mm shafts with set screws. I 3D printed them, but they should really be made out of metal. And here's the crank rod. Also printed, but really should be metal. The crankshaft bearings will rest on these standoffs. I need the standoffs so that the flywheel will clear the base plate. So far seems to spin okay. No binding or misalignment, and I'm not hitting the stops on the cylinder. Now let's give that old flywheel a new home. A good flick with my hand gives it a few rotations before it comes to a stop. That's a good sign that everything is aligned decently. Next, I mount this 80 tooth GT2 pulley onto the crankshaft. The motor will have a 16 tooth pulley, giving a 5 to 1 reduction, so the maximum unloaded speed should be about 2600 RPM or 44 Hz. In reality though, I doubt I'll run anywhere close to that. A really important part of the pulse tube, or really any cryo cooler, is the heatsink. This is especially important in my case because I'm going to have a pretty low compression ratio, so the heat is being rejected from the system at a relatively low temperature. This means I'll need a lot of surface area very close to the gas to get that heat to the outside world at a modest temperature differential. Let's crunch some numbers. I've got a dead volume of 56cc and a swept volume of 23cc using the 25mm cylinder, meaning I have a compression ratio of about 1.4. That gives a temperature ratio for adiabatic compression of 1.14. If ambient temperature is 300 Kelvin or 27 C, that means the temperature from compression will be 342 Kelvin or 68 C. That's a measly 42 degrees of difference that I have to get all the heat out across. The heat that needs to be removed in one cycle is the work that was put in, which comes out to 2.95 joules, assuming the compression is completely adiabatic. Now suppose I'm running at 10 Hz, and I need to get rid of that heat in half a cycle, meaning I have 50 milliseconds to dump 2.95 joules, which averages out to 59 watts of heat dissipation at the hot end. Doesn't seem too bad, right? Just a good copper tube should take care of it. Okay, let's say I've got my hot end. It's 2 centimeters long, and it has a 2 centimeter diameter. The thermal conductivity of air is 26 milliwatts per meter Kelvin. 
the weighted average distance from the tube wall works out to 1 minus root 2 over 2 or 0.29 centimeters. 12.6 centimeters squared of area and 42 degrees of temperature difference. And immediately we see that there's a big problem. That works out to just 0.47 watts of heat dissipation from the air inside to the walls. We're below the requirement by more than a factor of 100 and that's at maximum temperature difference, but the difference will be reduced as the heat is dissipated so the situation is even worse than it looks. So there's a misconception that having a highly thermally conductive pipe material will increase the heat dissipation, but the thermal bottleneck is actually the ability for the internal gas to transfer its heat to the pipe walls. That's the limiting factor. In ordinary refrigeration systems, refrigerant at the hot end is in liquid phase and has a very high thermal conductivity compared to any gas, so heat transfer to the walls is easy, but since cryocoolers by their nature have to use refrigerant in gas phase, we've got to be a bit more clever with the design. In a typical heatsink, you're probably used to seeing all the surface area on the outside, usually in the form of lots of thin fins, but in this case, we also need lots of surface area on the inside. Let's take our example of a hot end pipe, maintain the same cross-sectional area, but subdivide it into 100 smaller holes. We now have an array of 100 2 mm diameter pipes. This array has the same open area as the original pipe, but our surface area has now increased from 12.6 cm squared to 126 cm squared, a tenfold increase in contact area. Not only that, but the gas is now much closer to the contact area with an average distance of 0.29 mm. We've increased the heat transfer by a factor of 100, and our 0.47 watts is now 47 watts, which is much closer to our original goal of 59 watts. Also, in reality, because the air is in motion and there's turbulence, the heat transfer coefficient is going to be much higher than that 26 milliwatts per meter kelvin I cited earlier, which is for perfectly still air. Even so, internal heat transfer is a major factor in cooling power of the cryocooler. I should also point out that the approach to just making more and more smaller and smaller channels to keep increasing the heat transfer starts to become a liability after a little while because the flow resistance of a tube goes up inversely to the fifth power of its diameter, all other factors being constant. Now of course the flow is being divided into a larger number of channels as the channel diameters are reduced, but you still end up with a net increase in flow resistance even for the same opening area. In our example, by reducing the channel diameter tenfold, we've increased the relative flow resistance by a factor of 100,000 for a single channel. The mass flow is divided into 100 channels though, so the effective increase is only 1,000. Note that our increase in heat transfer only went up by a factor of 100 though, so the flow resistance increases much faster than the heat transfer does. This is one of the many reasons helium is used as the refrigerant for cryocoolers. It has six times better thermal conductivity than air. Anyway, having said all that, I settled on a design for a heatsink that's a 40 by 40 millimeter block of aluminum with about 51 millimeter diameter holes drilled through the thickness and some pockets that will allow me to press fit in 3D printed adapters. The adapters are attached with super glue and sealed with silicone. This is strong enough to hold pressure, but weak enough that I can break the parts loose if I want to change anything. Also, the red high temperature silicone is overkill for this project, but I prefer to use it because the color makes it easier to see if I missed any spots when I seal a joint. Next up is the regenerator tube, which is just an 80 millimeter length of PVC. The diameter is about 18 millimeters. To start off with, I'm gonna use this medium coarse steel wool as the mesh, making sure to cram it in tight. Steel wool can be really messy when you're cutting it or pulling it apart, but luckily it can be cleaned up really easily by just sweeping the work area with a neodymium magnet. Next, I've got the PVC coupler that'll go over the cold end of the regenerator. There's no good means of heat transfer from the gas to the walls, and the PVC is a poor thermal conductor, so I'm effectively creating a condition with no thermal load to measure the maximum temperature differential and not the cooling power. Then, I add a bracket to hold up the tube and another heat exchanger for the far side of the pulse tube, which has a needle valve attached to it. Let's do a quick spin test to see what happens to the temperature. Right now, I don't have the inertance tube or buffer tank hooked up, it's just the needle valve. Much better than the last version, about 12 degrees of drop within a few seconds just by spinning it by hand. Now I'll hook up the inertance tube and the buffer tank and run it off the motor to see what happens. Not a very impressive temperature drop. Maybe I need to increase the speed a little. Hmm, that's actually making the temperature difference even smaller. Maybe I need to adjust the valve a bit. Yeah, still pretty unimpressive. 
I think I'm going to have to tinker with the parameters of this thing a bit to optimize it, but to do that I need a slightly more scientific approach. I figured it would be helpful to chart performance by plotting temperature drop against piston frequency, so I stuck a magnet to one of the bolts on my flywheel and glued this coil with a few hundred turns near the edge of the wheel on the side the magnet was on. When I hook up my oscilloscope, I can see the voltage pulses in real time, and the scope detects the peaks to tell me the frequency. For starters, here's the result with the valve completely shut. Not much going on here aside from a small amount of surface heat pumping. But as I crack open the valve, the temperature drops noticeably more, topping out at about 15 degrees of temperature drop with the valve completely open. The fact that best performance occurred with the valve fully open seems to hint at the fact that either the valve is a limiting factor or my tiny diameter inertance tube causes too much flow resistance, so let's take the inertance tube out of the equation and connect the valve straight to the buffer tank. This caused a dramatic increase in the maximum temperature drop, and I managed to go below freezing temperature at the cold end of the regenerator. I chopped the 2mm diameter inertance tube down to progressively shorter lengths, with each shortening increasing the maximum temperature drop, though at a higher frequency. However, they still underperform the results with the tube removed entirely. As I mentioned earlier, flow resistance for a given length is inversely proportional to the fifth power of diameter, but inertance for a given length is only inversely proportional to the square of diameter. That means if I got a bigger diameter tube, even if I had to make it significantly longer to get the same inertance, I'd still get a dramatic reduction in flow resistance. So I removed the 2mm diameter tube and replaced it with 10 foot of quarter inch copper tubing which is approximately a 4.4mm inner diameter and 3 meters of length. The new tube is significantly larger, but I'm not too concerned about space constraints right now. This resulted in a tremendous improvement over the case with just the buffer tank, resulting in a maximum drop of 40 degrees and an internal temperature of minus 16 C. The next thing I set out to investigate was the effect of the pulse tube itself. By shortening it, I could increase the compression ratio of the system and thereby the maximum temperature differential, but it would also cause more mixing of the air inside the tube, diminishing the thermal buffer effect. If I increase the length, there would be much less chance for mixing and a better thermal buffer, but the compression ratio of the system would be reduced and there would be much more losses caused by friction. I tested lengths of 50, 100, 140, and 200 millimeters for the tube. The best performer by far was the 100 millimeter tube with a maximum temperature drop of 53 degrees C. The 100 millimeter tube also has almost the exact same volume as the swept volume of the compressor, which doesn't seem like a coincidence to me since the buffer gas volume seems like it would need to be similar to the amount of volume being displaced. I also tried a different consistency of steel wool for the regenerator, changing it from medium coarse to ultra fine, but surprisingly there wasn't really any noticeable difference in the performance. However, what did matter a lot was the length of the regenerator. A regenerator that's very short would have a low flow resistance but a lower heat storage capacity and lower maximum temperature differential, since there's a shorter distance across which the temperature gradient has to conduct. On the other hand, a regenerator that's too long would have a high thermal capacity and high maximum temperature gradient, but potentially create such a high flow resistance that the two advantages would be nullified, so I needed to find the sweet spot in between those extremes. I tried lengths of 30, 50, 80, and 120 millimeters, as well as this really big bulky regenerator just out of curiosity. Here are the performance curves for all of those trials. The 30 millimeter long regenerator performed the best by far, with the big bulky regenerator being the lowest performing. There also doesn't seem to be any indication that the performance was leveling off as I reduced the regenerator length, so I probably should have tried something even shorter than 30 millimeters, but I didn't get around to it while I was making this video. Even so, the temperature drop I reached was a lot more than I expected out of this device, peaking at 89 degrees, which was a minimum temperature of minus 75 C, just a few degrees away from the temperature required to freeze carbon dioxide into dry ice. Here you can see ice built up on the regenerator. This of course means I haven't properly removed all the moisture from the air inside the cooler, but it does show how cold it was in there. I think that was about as far as I could go tinkering with variables using the 25mm bore piston. Let's see what happens when I switch it out for the 40 millimeter. This should raise the swept volume from about 23 cc to 58 cc, which will raise the compression ratio from 1.4 to just over 2.0. Adiabatic compression work for the 25 millimeter piston was about 2.9 joules, whereas with the 40 millimeter piston it's about 9.5 joules. Also, the theoretical peak temperature of compression should go from 66 c to 118 c, making heat rejection a lot more efficient. Let's see what it does just by manually pumping the piston. Within a few seconds, I'm able to get the temperature about 10 degrees below freezing. That seems pretty promising so far.
Although before I run the 40 millimeter piston with the motor, I probably need to replace my 3D printed crank parts because the friction pretty much melted them to goo after a few hours of running. I machine crank blocks with my homemade CNC mill and a connecting rod with ball bearings, but there was another problem. I had bitten off a little more than I could chew with the bigger piston, and this motor didn't have the torque to handle it. So I changed from an 1100 kV motor to a 750 kV motor. If all the other factors are equal, that should provide me about 50% more torque at the expense of a lower max RPM, but in this case, that's a good trade-off. Now I got started up without any trouble. And here's a graph of the results. The 40mm piston started off really strong, and I expected it to get well past a 100 degree temperature drop, but as the frequency went past about 10 Hz, it started to level off and actually ended up slightly underperforming the 25mm piston. I did two more runs for repeatability and found that these results were pretty consistent. Here's a curve fit of the data points I collected in three runs, forming a pretty consistent S-shaped curve. This called for a little more investigation, so I also examined the effect of different positions of the needle valve at different frequencies and found that this had a pretty big effect on the temperature drop, so maybe it needed to be fine-tuned. Here's some graphs of temperature drop versus valve open percentage for 3, 5, 7, and 9 Hz on the 25mm piston. And here's the results of the same test carried out on the 40mm piston compared to the 25mm. If we take the maximums and compare them as a function of frequency, we find that both pistons give a very nice linear trend up to 9 Hz, with the larger piston clearly being more effective than the smaller. By extrapolating the linear trend, I'd expect a 140 degree temperature drop at 15 Hz, but the trend for the larger piston breaks down after 9 Hz. My suspicion is that this is either due to the excessive loss from flow resistance caused by the regenerator or heat exchanger. It's possible that at a certain frequency, the flow is restricted enough that it's becoming choked and going sonic, which would cause tremendous losses. It's also possible that it's not the components themselves, but the icing that occurs at lower temperature blocking the regenerator. Maybe that was acceptable with the smaller swept volume of the 25mm piston, but causes too much restriction with the 40mm piston. Finally, it could be that I'm reaching the maximum temperature gradient that the regenerator material can sustain without losing the rest to axial conduction, so maybe I need to switch from the regular steel to the stainless steel, which has much lower thermal conductivity. But I think that's where I'll leave it for this video. An 89 degree temperature drop is nothing to scoff at, even though it's under a no load condition. It's certainly colder than any fridge or freezer system or Peltier cooler can achieve. There's still a long way to go to minus 196C, but I think this is a very good first attempt and way better than I anticipated since I would have just been satisfied with hitting freezing temperatures. There's a lot more optimization that can be done here, and it's very possible that the key to improving performance isn't to increase the compression ratio, but to increase the average pressure of the system while having a relatively modest pressure ratio, which would increase the power density. This is how actual cryocoolers operate, typically being pressurized to 10 or 20 atmospheres, but having relatively small variations in the pressure ratio when they're operating. Of course, an easy way to get a big performance boost would be to use helium as a working gas, but pure helium is pretty expensive, so I don't want to attempt to use it until after I've optimized every other variable. A cheaper option might be to try using argon. Argon has a thermal conductivity that's somewhat lower than air, but being a monatomic gas has a higher specific heat ratio, meaning a given change in pressure causes a much larger change in temperature, so it could still be a net positive effect. Finally, I'm curious to see how an alpha sterling cooler using the same components compares to a pulse tube, since the phase shift can be precisely controlled by crankshaft geometry and the extra dead volume of a pulse tube isn't required, meaning the compression ratio could be increased. These are all things I'll be investigating in the next video, so if you found this interesting, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.